Good morning. morning. So good to be here this morning. Matthew 16. If you want to get out your Bibles and be turning to Matthew 16, that's where the lesson will be coming from this morning. Uh, We have received a very kind donation uh, that is two big screen TVs. Uh, So those are going to be coming up. So you should be able to see a little bit better what's on the screen. I feel like uh, sometimes... Those words are kind of hard to see, at least on my title slide. I try to make sure there's plenty of contrast on the rest of the slides, but uh, sometimes that's hard to see. Those TVs hopefully will help clear that up. And thank you uh, to whoever you are who donated uh, those TVs for us. We'll try to get those hooked up in the near future. If you're here this morning and you're a visitor, uh, we want you to know uh, how how much we appreciate your presence, uh, taking the time to come Uh, to a new place, to open up uh, God's Word and study with God's people is uh, something that we don't take lightly. We we appreciate your willingness to to do that, and we want you to know that you're especially welcomed here. Uh, We're we're just going to be worshiping God in simplicity uh, and striving to do the things that He has called us to do through the Word to encourage and build up one another. I appreciate all those who've led the service thus far and your, your work that you've put into uh, the service. Uh, I think it's very encouraging when men uh, take this seriously and they, pre- they prepare so well for the service. So uh, thank you very much for that as well. We're going to be working in Matthew. We've been working our way through this book, uh, and, and we're going to continue through this book. We, we just wrapped up kind of a summary section of Matthew and saw how... Uh, Jesus is struggling to develop uh, the disciples. He's struggling with the spiritual leaders of his day and and the crowds. And and there's just a lot of of struggle in Jesus' ministry. Uh, He has all these healings, all these miracles that he does. And yet there's still a lot of trouble uh, and and a lot of difficulty in the work that he's here to do. Well, that difficulty is not going to get any better. It's only actually going to get worse as we continue forward in the section that we're we're now going into today. Uh, And and we're going to see Jesus continue to develop the disciples. Really, the book of Matthew is so much about discipleship and developing uh, disciples. And and I think we're we're going to see that very clearly in our study uh, this morning. So to, to kind of introduce this idea, what I want us to do is just kind of take a second and think about our future. Uh, I worked uh, at, at a secular job, and one of the, the first things my boss's boss, you know, going into the boss's boss office is kind of a nerve-wracking thing. One of the first things that he had me do was fill out a five-year plan and a ten-year plan. <laughs> and just getting, you know, pretty fresh, uh, kind of new there, I didn't know what I was going to be doing that week much less five years from then or ten years from then. Uh, You know, this was kind of a ridiculous idea to me. It seemed seemed foolish. And in some ways it kind of is, right? Who knows where we'll be five years from now? Who knows where we'll be ten years from now? Uh, But but he wanted me to think about that and and to consider the future. And maybe you've done that in your job. Or maybe you've not done that and maybe you need to do that. And I think about what does your future look like? What is your five-year plan and what is your ten-year plan? What are, what are you hoping for? What are you seeing for yourself in the future? And what does that, that ideal life look like in five years or ten years? Uh, just reasonably uh, sketching that out in your mind and kind of keep that in your mind as we study this together this morning. And maybe that will help us to relate a little more closely to the things that we're going to study. We start out in Matthew 16, verse 13. That's where our text begins this morning. And it says this, When when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now notice this. Jesus begins by speaking to his disciples as they come into Caesarea Philippi. This would be one of the capital cities of that area, a very prominent city north of Galilee. He he asked his disciples a question. Who do they say I am? Who am I to them, to everybody else? You, You disciples are out there among the crowd. You're hearing whispers. You're hearing talk. What do they say about me? And the disciples come back and say, 
Well, some people are saying that you're John the Baptist. And that actually lines up with what we read back in chapter 14. You remember Herod had, had beheaded John the Baptist. And then he believed that Jesus was John the Baptist reincarnated. Jesus uh, was just John the Baptist come back from the dead. But others say Elijah. Now it's interesting because we saw in John the Baptist that he resembled Elijah, and we, we noted the prophecies in Malachi that God would send Elijah before he would come. And so now people are, instead of thinking that John the Baptist is Elijah, well, John's dead, now Jesus must be Elijah. But some are saying he's Jeremiah. <laughs> and then at that one, you're just kind of like, wait a second, why, why would you think Jeremiah? And honestly, I don't know. Um, the only thing that I can come up with here is that they see that J Jesus has been rejected like we've been seeing Jeremiah is rejected by those who are in authority and those who are leaders. And his message goes directly against what they are saying. And so the very obvious conclusion is this man's more like Jeremiah than he's like Elijah. That's very interesting. That this is the way he's perceived by the nations and by the, the crowds who were around him. That he might be Jeremiah. We continue reading in verse 15. It says, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So Jesus then turns to his disciples and says, who do you say that I am? You see the question gets more personal. And the statement from them is, from Peter is, you are the Christ. Now, Christ is significant. Nobody's been calling Jesus the Christ. Nobody's been calling him the Messiah. They called him the Son of God. And his disciples even called him the Son of God after he walked on water. But you go back into the first four chapters of Matthew, you see that Matthew set him up as being the Christ, and then after the setup, nobody's really grasped that he's the Christ, except now we see the disciples have, have understood that. They know he's the Christ. What does that mean, the Christ? You know, Jesus Christ, that's not his last name. <laughs> uh, sometimes I hear my children say, Jesus Christ, and I think, do you think that's his last name, you know? Um, no, it, it, it's his title. Mary was not Mary Christ, and Joseph was not Joseph Christ, and now Jesus Christ. No, this is his title. And that title means he's the Messiah. It means that he is the anointed one. That's the phrase, that's the idea that's wrapped up in that title, Christ. Jesus the Christ. So they understand that Jesus is the anointed king of Israel. Remember last week, we just studied Psalm 2. And we learned about the anointed one. Do you remember from Psalm 2 uh, how it said, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And then the anointed says... Uh, that God has told him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. The anointed is the son of God. And verse 12, it says, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. As a Jew, this is the meaning of, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the anointed one. You are the one who will be the king of Israel. And wrapped up in that idea is you are the savior. You are the one who is going to bring us back to our former glory. What a statement of hope that is. Coming out of the mouth of Peter. And Jesus answered him in verse 17. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Notice Jesus responds with blessing toward Peter. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar is uh, son of, so he's the son of Jonah. Simon was his given name. 
And he says, you are blessed because flesh and blood has not given this to you, has not revealed this to you. In other words, you didn't see this in my outer appearance. You didn't look at me and think, wow, he's the biggest and strongest. Surely he's the Lord's anointed. Uh, you didn't hear me and think, well, obviously he's, he's so eloquent. Obviously he, he's the Lord's anointed. You didn't, you didn't come to this conclusion because of some outward thing because I'm so strong or something. And you didn't come to this conclusion because you're so smart, Simon, because you're so well-trained and so perceptive. Jesus says, God has revealed this to you. The events that have happened in Simon's life and, and, and the working of God in his life has made it to where he understands who Jesus really is. And this is not something that would have been easy for them to grasp in the first century, obviously, because the crowds, for the most part, were struggling with this. The spiritual leaders were struggling with this. But Simon understood it, and the rest of the disciples, as well as we'll see, uh, understood he is the Christ. But this blessing is poured out on Peter. And he, he called him Simon, but then he changes to call him Peter. And the word Peter means rock. And it says, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, if you've read that text in the past, maybe you've heard some statement. Uh, you know, uh, the, yeah, the name Peter means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. That means, you know, some people say Peter's the, the pope and Peter's the, you know, this is the statement about Peter. But it is a statement lifting up Peter and talking about Peter. Uh, at one time, I used to think on this rock was referring to his confession. And, and maybe you believe that as well. But listen to how Peter's being talked about here. You are Peter. And the word Peter in Greek would sound just like rock. Petra, Petrus. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's, he's foretelling when Christ builds his church, Peter will be a rock at the foundation. Peter will be a rock upon which Jesus will be able to build his church. Now, this is not a physical building. Obviously, this is a figure of speech referring to the people who make up the church. And this shouldn't surprise us if we know Ephesians 2, which was just read for the Lord's Supper, uh, fortuitously, fortuitously maybe, uh, that, that the, the, the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Peter is a foundational rock in the building of Christ's church. And, and he even gives Peter additional credit and additional responsibility. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You see how he's given this stewardship. You imagine the master of a house telling one of his, his head servants, here are the keys. You're going to be the one who opens and allows the people to come in and closes and keeps people from coming in. And this responsibility, it seems, was given to Peter to, to begin the church. In Acts 2, we see him open the gates for the Jews on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 10, we see him open the gates for the Gentiles, for Cornelius. And we see Peter is given this wonderful role in the Lord's church as a foundation uh, to help build the church of God's people, the, the group, the congregation of God's people. That's what the word church means. <laughs> we always think church is the church building, but of course it's the people. Then notice he strictly charged his disciples in verse 20 to tell no one that he was the Christ. Isn't that odd? You know, over and over again we see Jesus telling people who he heals, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. Uh, and here he tells his disciples, obviously now they know for sure you are the Christ. And he says, don't tell anybody. Why would he do that, you know? Uh, well, I think as you study the book of Matthew so far, you come to the understanding along with me that nobody understands this kingdom. If they think he's the Messiah, if they think he's the anointed king of Israel... And they want to pressure him to be king like it says they did in John 6 whenever he fed the 5,000. If they're trying to pressure him to be the king of a kingdom that's not like the kingdom he's come to establish, that's going to make life very difficult for him. 
And so Jesus doesn't go everywhere proclaiming, I am the Christ, I am the Messiah, I am the anointed one, I am the King of Israel, you must bow before me, you must serve me. No, he keeps it under wraps. And he doesn't go out proclaiming it for everybody to hear because nobody would understand it if they heard it. They wouldn't know what to do with it. They would take it the wrong way. Well, I usually try to take smaller sections, but this one just continues, and we got to keep going. Notice how he, 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 he explains this to his disciples. The reason why you can't tell anybody that, that I'm the Christ. Let's continue reading. Verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Jesus tells them the, the truth about the future, what, what the future holds. These disciples haven't, they haven't read the New Testament. They don't know what, what's coming. They've just seen that Jesus is the Messiah doing all these miracles, and then they're just sitting there expecting to, to because he's the Lord's anointed, to take over and to become this great king. And then Jesus hits them with this bomb. No. That's not why I'm here. That's not what I've come here to do. I am I'm come here to suffer and to die. As we continue our study throughout this section, we'll see three times Jesus tries to get this to sink in to the minds of his disciples. I have come to die, and I will be raised again on the third day. But notice how the disciples take this first instance, verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Wow. You see how Peter didn't see that coming at all. In fact, Peter can't believe it. He can't believe that this is what's going to happen. Can you imagine hearing this for the first time? No way, Jesus. You've got all these miracles at your disposal. You're the Lord's anointed. I know what Psalm 2 says God's going to be on your side, Jesus. Maybe he's trying to encourage him and give him a pep talk. God's going to be on your side. You don't have to worry about anybody killing you, Jesus. You can't be saying that and discouraging people because then people might leave. <laughs> and Peter is rebuking Jesus. Well, of course Peter would do that, right? He's the guy that's the head steward. He's going to be given the keys to the kingdom, right? He's the, he's the guy. He's the one who's got to be the, the guy that comes in and corrects Jesus whenever he needs correction and help. But Jesus is not so happy about this. In verse 23, he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Wow. That's, that's a pretty significant fall. <laughs> uh, you know, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church to you are Satan. Get behind me. What a, what a tra transition has happened in this storyline. Jesus doesn't hold back whenever he talks to Peter and he tells him that he's acting like Satan. You remember back in Matthew chapter 4 whenever he is being tempted in the wilderness? Satan's whole plan was to convince Jesus, you can have all the blessings, you can have the kingdom, and you don't have to die for it. I'll give it to you. Just bow down and worship me. And Jesus points out, Peter, you sound a lot like Satan right now. That's who you sound like. And so he rebukes Peter for saying that. And then he says at the end there that you're setting your mind on the, on the things of man and not on the things of God. Peter's focus is on the wrong things. After he says this to Peter, he turns to his disciples. And listen to what he tells them. He says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would, would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? 
For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Notice how he says this, this to his disciples. He said it to Peter. You're focusing on the things of man, not the things of God. And then he turns to his disciples and he reinforces this and he tells them, if you want to follow me, you can't be focused on the things of man. And the way he words it is, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And this is what he tells his disciples they must do. He says, if you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you'll willingly lose your life for my sake, then you will find it. Wow. You see how he's telling his disciples the same thing he told Jesus, the uh, same thing he told Peter. You can't, you can't be focused on exalting yourself, Peter. You can't be focused on having this earthly kingdom where we go and we take over the Romans and we get set up. You know, I said, imagine your five-year plan and your ten-year plan. Peter's, what does Peter's five-year plan look like? <laughs> what does his ten-year plan look like? It looks pretty good. And it looks very good for him <laughs> and his, his uh, prosperity. It all looks really good. But Jesus is trying to help him see his focus is on the things of man. And so the five-year, ten-year, whatever his plan is, is out of step with what God wants it to be. But then the second half of this, he reinforces, first of all, he reinforces the rebuke, and he makes sure all the disciples see that you can't live for yourself. That's not the way this works. And then he, he reinforces the reward. And he says, look, if, you're, if you give up your life, you're going to find it. If you lose your life, for my sake, you're going to find it. And then he says, because I'm coming back, guys. I told you I must die, but I will return. And when I return, I will repay each person according to what he's done. Now, the first part of this was so hard on me for the longest time that whenever I'd read the second part, I'd be like, I better give up my life or whenever he comes back, he's going to repay me and, and it's going to be really bad. But look at the way this is worded. He's, come, he's going to come with his angels and he's going to repay each person according to what he's done. And then it says, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming. And he says, he's going to be coming with his angels in the glory of his Father. You're going to see me coming in all my glory. And if you've given up your life to serve me, you're going to be a part of that. You see what he's saying here. It sounds a lot like what he said back in the Sermon on the Mount. Do you remember that? Do you remember back in Matthew 6 where he said, Don't lay up treasures for yourself on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up treasures for yourself in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's pointing his disciples again to this idea that there is eternal glory to be obtained in me if you will lose your life and gain me. And so that's the message that we see in this book. Is, and, and in this section in particular, this is like the, the, the core of the book. That to be a disciple is going to be a struggle. These guys have given up Everything. So they've given up careers. They've given up future prosperity. They've given up their, 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 their family life to go and to follow Jesus. You just imagine giving all that up and then seeing Jesus is the Christ. He really is the Messiah. And then you start to get your hopes up and you think, yes, this is going to be everything I hoped it, hoped it could be. Imagine yourself being Peter 
And hearing these words, <laughs> I'm going to build my church on you, Peter. How exciting that would be. And then Jesus reveals to them, I'm going to die. And I'm going to be raised from the dead and I'm going to return, but I'm going to die. And if you want to follow me, you've got to go down this path. I know what you've done is a lot, but you're not done yet. I know you've given up a lot, but you haven't given up everything yet. And Peter, in all of this struggle, is told by Jesus, as long as you're focusing on the things of man, you're in line with Satan. <laughs> You're thinking about the things of man just as Satan wants you to. And I've got plans for you, Peter, but you can't continue down that path. The disciple must have their minds set on the things of God and not on the things of man. Well, if that's the standard, then who's going to follow Jesus to the cross? That's the message and that's the question in this, in this book. Who's going to willingly lose their life to find it. This is weight on me. This is a tough, tough idea for us to apply to ourselves. I don't think there's many texts that hit harder than this text. In our five and ten year plans, how much of it is seeking the profit of this world? How much time are we dwelling on? How we can gain more? How we can set aside this amount of money? How we can add these things to our lives and make our lives more comfortable? Jesus is calling for us to consider the value of these things that we're planning on. Consider the value. They seem so valuable to everybody around us. And so many times they seem valuable to us. Are they really that valuable? Sometimes we act like Peter. We'll state the truth. Jesus, you are the Christ. We believe in you. We know you're the anointed one. We know that you're the king of Israel. And yet... Our minds are set fully on the things of man and not the things of God. The rebuke that Jesus gives his disciples is the rebuke that we also need to hear. When we're focused too much on the things of this world and we're not considering the things of God, we need to consider what it would be like to lose our life for Christ's sake. He says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? We need to consider the reward of having your soul, <laughs> of having eternal life with God in heaven. And compare that with the, the value of the things that are here that we're seeking and, and trying to find and trying to get over and over and over again. What would it look like for us to take up our cross and follow Jesus? I've heard people make statements about this. Some people will say, well, I know my cross is my in-laws, and uh, <laughs> I know my cross is my wife or my husband. I know my cross is my job. Uh, I know my cross is the government. I know my cross is my disability. And I don't want to belittle any of those things if they're, they're trials to you. I understand. But when Jesus says, take up your cross, what he's telling us is, we have to deny ourselves completely. There's all these comforts and all these things that we, we could pursue. There's this great future we could be setting up for ourselves. There's all this treasure we could be setting aside for ourselves on this earth. And he says, you need to just say no to that. Deny yourself that. Lose your life. Now, I don't lose things willingly. <laughs> I lose things a lot sometimes, but 
I don't lose things willingly. He says, you need to lose this willingly. You need to let go of the things that are of this world. And you need to pursue me with everything. It doesn't mean you, you have to sell everything you have and, and blah, blah, blah. You know, it doesn't, doesn't mean that, but it means everything that we have in this world is being used to seek God's kingdom first. Notice the disciples actually didn't take up their cross, literally, and follow Jesus to it whenever he went. They weren't ready for that yet. They were still growing. They were still developing. And he understood and he knew that. But you know, Peter, from historical records, ended up on a cross. Because he lost his life and he decided to seek after the Lord. And as a result, people hated him for it. And eventually they did to him the same thing they did to Jesus. He wasn't seeking it necessarily. But he made this decision in his mind and in his heart that serving God was more valuable than all the things of this earth. I want to close with an idea that I don't even remember where it came from. It may have come from one of our Bible classes. We have great Bible classes. You guys have wonderful comments. It may have come from one of you or it may have come from someone else I was talking to. When you think about the book of Job, if you know that book, you know he lost everything, right? You imagine God coming up to you and saying, I'm going to take everything away from you. I'm going to take all your children and take all your riches. And I'm going to, I'm going to let you suffer immense physical pain. But it's going to be for my glory. How many of us are like, yep, sign me up? Like, I don't know if I'm there yet. But that's where we need to be. That's where we need to grow to in this life. We need to learn to lose it so that we can find life in God. Because the eternal riches are worth more than all the things of this earth combined. If you're here this morning and you don't have Christ as your Lord and your Savior... I hope you can understand that He is the Lord. He did come to earth and die, and His death was not an accident, nor was it something that was unplanned. It doesn't mean that He, he failed His mission. He knew before He went to the cross He was going there. But He went there anyway for us, because He loved us. Whenever we start pursuing the things of God, we may lose a lot, but we'll end up showing love to other people. And that's what Christ did for us. He took up his cross. He suffered for us. And if you're here this morning and you haven't accepted the gift that he's offered you, I hope that you will before it's too late. I know that it's asking a lot for you to give up your life to serve him. But it's worth it. And if we can help you in any way, please let us. Please come. Please come as we stand and sing.